And so uh, I'd like to start out uh, with a picture on slide seven, uh, which gives a little context of uh, why you typically would do risk management. And there's, there's primarily two places uh, to start uh, risk assessment and risk management. And the first one is in a planning cycle. Uh, when you're doing a project of any kind, uh, whether it's an agile or a waterfall or a spiral project, uh, there's a planning activity in there somehow. And so this is a, just a generic picture of a planning cycle. Uh, so the first step at the very top is uh, some scoping uh, requirements activities. Uh, that could be getting a spec or a requirements list or a statement of work. It could be getting a backlog in a Scrum Agile uh, world. Uh, the second step on the right is uh, then doing some task listing, uh, the defining a WBS or work breakdown structure or a task list, and then uh, defining some estimates uh, that goes along with that. Again, that could be in a sprint planning activity in an in agile uh, scrum uh, project. And so what I would do is take the risk session uh, as described today uh, as an example and add that into the uh, planning activities uh, after we have some tasks defined and some estimates defined. And the reason for doing it at that point is because uh, so some of the input into the risk session uh, will be the tasks that are derived in the previous step uh, because some of those can actually be risky tasks. And some of the estimates that are derived uh, are based upon assumptions, uh, assumptions about resources being available, assumptions about are the work being complete. And some of those assumptions actually could become false or could be invalid. And so therefore, the, some of the assumptions actually become input uh, to the risk session too. So by doing the risk at that step in the cycle, uh, you have a little, little bit better data to work with as inputs of the risk. And then uh, the next step is to build a schedule. It could be a release plan or a schedule or a timeline. And uh, what we do there is take the output of the tasks and the estimates and the things that are risky, and we combine those into a schedule. So, for example, there could be actions we'll discuss in the, the cycle here uh, that are risk mitigation actions. They could be added to the schedule. And there could be things that are high risk or features in high risk areas of the system or project uh, they need to be going to put it earlier in the schedule to be worked on earlier. And we'll discuss that a little bit later on. Uh, but uh, the good thing about having a schedule activity after risk is that you can actually then uh, comprehend or incorporate the risk data into the schedule. And then the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, fifth step around is a, 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 um, a regular commitment uh, negotiation step. And then we start the project or that phase or that sprint and then track progress. Uh, so that's the first place I would typically do risk is, is uh, add it to a planning activity uh, for now. Uh, the second one is that at any time, really, uh, you don't actually need to have any prerequisite done uh, before doing risk. Uh, you could put the phone down at the end of the session and then uh, meet with your team and then res run, run the risk session in just, the way, uh, just in the way described in the, in the session today, and it would work fine. Uh, but the next time you do planning, uh, you may want to then add the risk to the planning cycle uh, to give a little, little bit better input uh, to the risk session. So uh, next slide is going to be on the uh, a little definition of risk. Uh, for the purpose of today's discussion, uh, basically it's anything negative that could occur. Uh, if it's guaranteed to occur, it's a, it's a problem. It will go onto a problems list or an issues list. Uh, but if it's not guaranteed, uh, then it's a risk. It's a potential problem. And so in this picture on slide eight, uh, we have a patient, and he or she is there because they have a problem, uh, for example, a broken leg or some uh, 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 malady. Uh, but they also have outstanding risks. Uh, things could occur downstream uh, that have to be assessed and mitigated. Uh, they could have an allergic reaction to drugs. They could have an infection problem uh, from the hospital to pick up an inf infection. Uh, they could have health insurance issues, too. And so although they, they have a problem, and which is kind of why they're there, uh, there really are things that could go wrong that could be traumatic uh, that have to be assessed and they're mitigated. Or if they have that problem and the risk becomes a problem, uh, there should be a backup plan in place to, uh, to deal with that. So the four steps uh, we'll go through uh, are basically to identify risk, uh, top left, uh, top right, analyze risk. Uh, because there's typically more issues or more risks in the list uh, than you can work at one time. So we have to analyze and determine where to go focus. And then the bottom right, uh, plan to mitigate, uh, we'll discuss two uh, levels of planning. Uh, one is to avoid the risk, 
and then secondly to be prepared as a backup plan if the risk becomes actually a problem. And then we'll discuss at the very end uh, why you would typically add a risk review into the cycle of a project uh, to kind of keep on top of the risk list and look downstream further, again, uh, for new risks that may be occurring. And I'll explain the basic time frame of doing this too as we go through, uh, so you have a, a rough idea of how much time to spend doing this. Uh, I would say to begin with on a project uh, that could be five to ten people and you may have uh, six months to a year worth of work to do, uh, the whole cycle should be about two hours, an hour and a half to two hours. And if you have a much smaller project, maybe a couple of people and a few months, uh, the whole cycle could be uh, an hour or less. And so I'll explain uh, some example time frames for the steps as we go through. Now the first one was identify risk. <clears throat> and here we are looking for potential future problems, uh, things that are not happening now are not guaranteed to happen, and therefore they are risks. <clears throat> and so uh, the suggestions there, a couple of different ways you could do this. Uh, one is you could, uh, you could have a project manager uh, create a list by him or herself. Uh, the downside of that is that they typically don't know where all the risks actually are. Uh, they know where some of them are, uh, maybe budget and schedule resource risks, uh, but they may not be tied in all, into all the details of the project to understand where some of the technical issues uh, could be too. And so what I recommend is brainstorming with the whole team uh, so you get both the manager's perspective and the practitioner's perspective uh, too. So practitioners, developers, testers, QA people, etc., uh, business analysts, uh, they can point out things that could go wrong technically uh, that other team members may be not aware of. So I think the intent here is to get a good list, a comprehensive list, uh, not just a management perspectives list. And the last comment on that slide is that you may decide to have in the risk session uh, other people that really could help you think of uh, downstream potential problems. Uh, maybe there are people that have done work like this before in the organization, and you can tap them for a half an hour to come up with a list, a list of risks. Uh, there could be ex uh, technical experts in the field you have access to. And if you think about what risk is, uh, risk is a uh, downstream looking activity. And if you actually invite some of your downstream uh, champions or your recipients of your work, uh, they can help you think of risk too, uh, because the problems you are causing for them uh, could be assessed in this risk, se risk session uh, by having those downstream people involved in the session at this point. So do be uh, flexible about the kind of people you invite to the risk activity uh, because it may help you think a little bit more globally, uh, globally about the things that could go wrong uh, downstream and today on the project. So when you uh, do risk assessment, uh, typically you're going to have these type of issues being looked at in the list. Uh, weak areas, uh, such as unknown technology, this may be new uh, or new to the field or new to the team, uh, like a development tool or a target machine. Again, because it's new, there are unknowns that you're not aware of, and that means it makes it risky. And that could be a, an example of what would go into a risk list in the brainstorm. Uh, things that are critical are extremely important to the effort. If you look at your task list of your project, and you see some steps in there which, if they uh, don't get done correctly, uh, could cause problems downstream. Those tasks themselves could be flagged as a risky task in the risk list. So, for example, uh, often companies that do or software systems, uh, they have a translation activity uh, from an old version of a database to a new version or an old data type or kind of data format to a new type. And uh, some aspect of the project is a translating or uh, running a translator uh, to take old data and uh, create new data out of that. And if that little step of the translation actually uh, breaks or has a problem, uh, there could be a major impact downstream on the project and the quality of the data at the end. So looking through the task list of the project, you may identify